Good morning. Good morning. One of the dearest professors I had in college always used to tell us young preacher boys, music is the handmaiden to evangelism. And that's true. And the music we just sang this morning with the praise team surely prepared our hearts to worship the mighty God who created this universe and created you and me. For some of you who don't know, my name is John Keith. Uh, I work for the Treasure Coast Baptist Association. I'm the church engagement strategist. Uh, I retired after being a pastor for 54 years, and I came down here from Tennessee, and uh, Tim asked me to work with him, and it's been a joy and a pleasure to work with uh, Tim. He's a man who has missions on his heart. Uh, he's kingdom-minded. Uh, he's a man who casts vision very well, and it's been a, my pleasure to work with him, and also Mike Goddard, he's a pleasure to work with. Behind-the-scenes guy. And if he didn't do the stuff he did behind the scenes, you wouldn't see a lot of good stuff going on. And I appreciate you, Mike. I really, really do. Did you bring your Bibles? Hold them up. Listen, every time you come to the house of God to hear the man of God, bring the precious word of God, because that's what's going to make a difference in your life. I always tell people I preach to, check the preacher out by the word. Sometimes I make mistakes. But God's Word never makes a mistake. It's true from cover to cover without any mixture of error. It's uh, profitable for a, a doctrine, reproof, and helps you live a life pleasing to God. I'm going to be preaching from Matthew 21, verses 28 through 32. Uh, the subject is, yes or no, will you go? Yes or no, will you go? From Matthew 21, I'm going to read verses 28 through 32. And then I'll lead us as we pray. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he regretted it, and he went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first, Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him, and when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Almighty God, we come into your presence today. Your goodness is running after us. Your goodness has run after me every single day of my life, and I'm so thankful. Father, I pray that as I preach this message, your Holy Spirit would just speak to every heart. There's folks here you've been speaking to before they came. There's folks here that's been wanting to know what you want them to do, and you've made it plain what you want them to do, and the answer is, will I go? And I pray that they would. Father, I pray that uh, Jesus will be glorified and lifted up. We'll be careful to give you all the credit and the glory and the praise and the honor because it belongs to you and no one else. I pray these things in the mighty name of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you know what the opposite of ignorance is? It's obedience. Let me tell you why I say that. Oftentimes we say we don't know what God's will is. Well, once you know what God's will is, Obedience is what you have to do. And disobedience is the opposite of obedience. You know, oftentimes we know what God's will is, but we're not willing to do it. Why did Jesus speak this parable? You see, every parable has a main point. Many applications, but one main point. And to get the answer to why Jesus told this parable, you have to have the context. This happens right after the triumphal entry, the last week in Jesus' life. As he comes into Jerusalem, riding onto the foal of a, of a donkey, the people begin to holler, Hosanna, blessed to be the son of David. And they take their coats and cast them in the road and palm branches, they throw them down on the road. And as he comes through, they're hollering praise to God. He goes straight into the temple and he begins to cleanse the temple. Turns over the tables, kicks out the money chambers. He said, my house should be a house of prayer. You made it a den of thieves. And the religious leaders come to him and they said, what gives you the right to do this? What gives you the authority to come in here and upset our little playhouse? Basically, they're saying, who do you think you are? 
What gives you the right to do this? And he asked him a question about the baptism of John the Baptist. He said, okay, if you answer this, I'll answer that. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or among men? And the scripture tells us they reasoned among themselves. See, they weren't concerned about what was true. They were just concerned about convenience. Well, if we say it's from heaven, he'll say, why didn't you believe it? And if we say it's from men, we fear the people because everybody knows that John's a prophet. And so they say, well, we cannot tell. And he said, neither do I tell you. Didn't say he didn't know. He said, neither do I tell you. And then he told this parable. He said, what do you think? And the point of this parable is divine authority and human response. And so I'm going to ask you that question. What do you think about divine authority? You see, the question is not what's right, because most of us know what's right. The question is, will you do it? Will you do what's right? And when you know, will you go? Yes or no? Notice with me, first of all, if you would, the father's request. He comes to his son, and basically this is a command. He said, go to work in my vineyard today. What right did he have to ask his son to go work in his vineyard? He had the authority because he fathered that young boy. He sired him. He had the right to ask him that. My father worked at General Motors when I was a kid. And our family got in kind of a financial bind. And so he took a part-time job in the evenings as a custodian in a nursing home. He worked there several months till the financial pinch was over. And then he decided to quit. And he got them to hire me for the job. And so I'm 15 years old. This is the first job I've had besides mowing yards and throwing newspapers. So we're working together for a couple of weeks, and he's breaking me in, and he tells me to do something. I say, you're not my boss here. You can't tell me what to do here. He said, I'm your boss when we get home. You do like I told you. You see, he had every right to ask me to do that because he was my father. God has every right to ask you to serve him. He's your creator. If you're a Christian, he saved you. 1 Corinthians 6, 20, you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. Notice he said today, go to work in my vineyard today. Not tomorrow, but today. Every time God makes a call on a person's life, it's always today. He doesn't say tomorrow, he says today. Today. And there's kind of an urgency in that, you know. An urgency, go to work in my vineyard today. I have a task for you today. I need you today. You obey and I'll take care of the details. In Acts chapter 8, we have the record of where Philip, he's preaching in Samaria. There's a great revival going on. The Bible says people are being saved. People are being healed. Wonderful things are happening. And right in the middle of that, the Spirit of God speaks to him and says, I want you to go down to Gaza. And Gaza was the desert. Here he is in the midst of a great revival, people being saved, people being healed, great joy in the city, the Bible says, because of the gospel. And right in the middle of that, God says, leave here and go to Gaza. And the interesting thing is, Philip doesn't argue, he doesn't procrastinate, he goes. And when he gets there, there's an Ethiopian eunuch in a chariot, a man who was a treasurer to the queen, a man of great authority. And when he got there, the Spirit said, join yourself to that man in the chariot if you read Acts chapter 8 it says he had to run to catch up to that chariot had he delayed had he argued had he said no way God this doesn't make sense he would have missed connections there was an urgency in that call God's call takes precedence over everything else in your life and when he calls the question is yes or no will you go my wife and I were blessed with five children. Our youngest daughter's named Ari, named after my father's mother, Ari Keith. She graduated from PBA, and the year after she graduated, we moved to Utah. She came out there to stay with us for a while, and uh, she got an opportunity to go to South Africa for about three months. And she told me, she said, Dad, I want to be a missionary, but I want to be married first. I don't want to surrender to missions until God gives me a husband. And, and I, I feel called, but I want to be married first. And I said, Ari, God's call takes precedence over everything. You follow the Lord's call, and if you're obedient to the Lord, he'll provide you a husband. 
So at the end of her three-month stay in Africa, she called up and she said, I, I, I'm going to go to seminary. I'm going to go to Southeastern. So she called our son-in-law, who graduated from there, and he made some calls. She left South Africa on Sunday. She got to the seminary on Monday, and she started classes on Tuesday. Pretty fast. The first semester, she met a young man by the name of Jonathan Cole from Dallas, Texas. That's the only fault I got in him, folks. <laughs> you can always tell a Texan, you just can't tell him much. <laughs> no, that's not true. I'm, I, he's a fine young man. The first semester she was there, she met Jonathan. They dated for about a year, and they got married, and he had a call on his life, and they'd been serving in Japan for over 10 years, right outside of Tokyo. Had she not been obedient to the Lord's call to give herself to missions, she wouldn't have went to seminary, she wouldn't have met Jonathan Cole, and she wouldn't be serving God in Tokyo. You see, God's call on your life takes precedence over everything else. When he calls, he'll take care of the details in your life. Notice the son's refusal here. The father said, go to work in my vineyard today. And he said, no. It's kind of a knee-jerk reaction. Now, I don't know how you are, but I've noticed in my life, almost every time when God first speaks to me, I say, no. I can't think of a single church. Every, almost, I think every single church I went to, I first said, no, I'm not going there. I remember I went to the Williamstown Baptist Church. I said, Lord, I don't want to go. I went kicking and screaming. I told my wife, and we moved into Parsonage, I said, don't unload those boxes. We ain't staying here six months. We stayed there four years. And every year we baptize over 30 people every single year. Every single year. God knows what he's doing, you know. Why is it we're like that? When God first calls us to do a job or a task, we say no. Is it because we don't like to take orders? Is it because we have something else going, you know? I wonder how his father felt when he said, I'm not going. You think his father was angry? You think his father was maybe sad? The Bible doesn't say he rebuked the son. But I imagine the father was kind of hurt when his son said, no, I'm not going to work with you today. I read about a young father of a preschool boy. His wife was working one Saturday. He took him to McDonald's for lunch. And he bought him a meal, and he bought him some french fries. And while he was sitting there, he just kind of absently reached over to get a french fry. And the little boy said, no, mine. He thought, you little ingrate. I bought you this meal. I got enough money, I could buy enough french fries to bury you in. You ungrateful little twerp. And then he said, God spoke to him and said, that's how I feel sometimes. When I ask for things from you and you say mine when I ask for some of your finances and you say mine I like what you said in the first service everything we have is a gift from God and folks he only asks us to give back 10% just 10% it's all his and so all he asks us to give back is 10% of our earnings to him we ought to be thankful we're able to do that. That's part of our worship. I like how you said that this morning. We'll continue our worship, you know. Have you ever thought about what a privilege it is to work for God? The creator of the universe. There's over 7 billion people on planet Earth. And God wants you to work with him. Now you think about that. Out of the 7 billion people in the world, God wants to hang out with John Keith. That blows my mind. If God had a mantle, your picture would be on it. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on his refrigerator. You are precious to God, and he wants you to work with him. Paul said we are co-laborers with Christ. What a privilege. What an honor. How dare we say no to that great honor of working with him? I read about a young boy who came home from school and he went upstairs to change his clothes and he heard his mama call his name. He thought, oh, great. She wants me to do some chores. So instead of going downstairs, he opened the window, shimmied down the tree, went to the ballpark, stayed all day. Come back late that evening, kind of dreading. He knew he was in trouble. His mom said, didn't you hear me call? Yes, mom. Why didn't you come? I thought you had work for me to do. She said, no, it was a party. You missed a great party with your friends. I wanted to bless you with a party, and you didn't come. 
God wants to bless you with serving him. It's a joy to serve him. And we say no to the biggest blessings of our life sometimes. What are some reasons why you think this young man said no? Maybe he didn't like taking orders. You know, teenagers don't like being bossed around, do they? You know? You get a certain age, you think mom and dad don't know nothing. My dad used to say when I was about 16, son, one of these days you're going to wake up and say, how did my old man get so smart overnight? You know, that's true. <laughs> you, you, you know, we, we used to call it going up fool's hill. You know, when you get a certain age, you start climbing fool's hill. Nobody can tell you nothing. You know, you think you're smarter than mom and dad. You know, maybe he was like that. I had a Sunday school teacher said he got tired of his daddy telling him what to do. He said, I'll show you. He went and joined the Marine Corps. <laughs> he showed him all right, you know. <laughs> Maybe he had other plans. I had other plans for my life. I wanted to be an airline, airplane pilot. That's what my goal was. And God said, no, I want you to preach the gospel. But Lord, this is my plan. For, no, this is what's best for you. I can't think of anything else that gave me more satisfaction than preaching the gospel. I, I, I shudder to think what would have happened had I said no to God's call on my life and coming down to the end of my life and realizing I blew it. I missed God's call for my life. He had a divine call on my life, and I did something completely different. Listen, when you step away from God's call, you step down. God knows you better than you do. God knows what will make your life fulfilled more than you do. There's some of you sitting here, God has a divine call on your life. He may be calling you to life as a missionary. He may be calling you as a pastor. He may be calling you to further service in this church. And you're saying no. You're saying no to some of the biggest blessings of your whole life. Yes or no, will you go? He may have felt like it was beneath him. Here I am, my father owns the vineyard. And he wants me to work. He wants me to do manual labor. It's beneath me. There are no small tasks for the Lord. There are no small churches and big churches. They're all churches of the living God, and any service he calls you to do is a huge blessing. God, however you can use me, I'm willing for you to do that. If you're not willing to do little things, God can't use you to do big things. You can't be too small for God to use, because you sure can't get too big. Sometimes I feel like Southern Baptists got a little too big for their britches. We need to be humble before the Lord. It says that he regretted it. I wonder what it made him regret it. Now, the Bible doesn't say the father rebuked him. He didn't say anything. He just went to the second son. Maybe he saw the hurt in his father's eyes. I do not want to grieve the Lord. The Bible tells us in Ephesians, grieve not the Holy Spirit wherewith you're sealed into the day of redemption. Disobedience grieves the heart of God. After all, he's done. The goodness of God overwhelms us and surrounds us, and we dare tell him no. Maybe he was ashamed to treat his father like that. We ought to be ashamed to treat God like we do. I don't believe we reverence the Lord like we ought to. I don't believe we're truly as grateful to God as we should be for all that he's done. I remember when our kids were small, we had five, like I said, and my wife Linda said, I don't think our kids appreciate us. They don't appreciate all we do for them. And I said, they don't. And neither did we until we had kids. You won't appreciate the sacrifice your parents made until you become parents. You won't appreciate the sacrifice Jesus made for you until you have to sacrifice for him. Maybe he counted the cost of disobedience. Folks, there's a cost for disobedience. There's a price for serving God. You'll pay a price for serving Jesus. There's Christians around the world, I think every 30 seconds there's a martyr for the cause of Jesus somewhere in the world. Did you know that? There's a price, but listen, there's a higher cost of disobedience. We're free moral agents. We can choose to disobey, but listen, you're not free from the consequences. Our nation wants to thumb their nose at God and turn their back on God and do what they want to do and be blessed. Listen, God will not bless disobedience. Disobedience and blessings are opposed to one another. 
And for several generations, our nation has run as far from God as they can run. You read Haggai chapter 1. It says, consider your ways twice in chapter 1. Consider your ways. He said, you work hard, you bring home nothing. And what you do bring home, you put it in a bag full of holes, and I blow on it and blow it away. He said, I've not blessed your crops, I've not blessed your land, there's been national disasters. And then God says, why? Because of your disobedience. You live in your sealed houses and say, it's not time to build my house. God said he did that. Lord, look at our land. Look at our nation, folks. The economic woes, the floods, e uh, uh, natural disasters, the fires in Texas, Oklahoma, California. It's like hell has vomited out corruption on our land, folks. And it's like God said, you don't want me? I'll just take my hand of protection away from you. And give you what you want, your own way. Listen, there's something wrong. I told the first service, and I'm going to share it with you. The reason I believe our land is so corrupt and polluted is because of the failure of the church. We've not been the salt. We've not been the light. Our, the culture is shouting things contrary to the word of God, and the church is silent. Listen, there's something wrong with the people who say they can't define what a woman is. They can't define what a man is. And that you can decide your gender after you're born. There's something wrong. Even nature knows better than that. And the church is silent about that. And while the church is silent, the culture shouts, tells young people, you decide what you want to be. You decide. Listen, you can't decide to be what you're not. You can't change your gender. If you're born a woman, you're a woman. You can say you're a man all you want to. You're just lying to yourself. God made you what he wanted you to be. And there's something wrong with a people who cannot determine what the sex of a baby is when it's born. And that's where we are in our culture today. They appoint people like that to high positions in our government while the whole world laughs and makes America a mockery because of our stupidity. Folks, it's time for the church to stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, like the prophets of old, you know. Some of you here today know what God's call is on your life, and you feel bad about it but you don't feel bad enough to obey. You're kind of like a farmer's dog I read about. Sitting on the porch, his dog's laying by his feet. A neighbor comes by to visit with him, and there's the dog laying on the porch going, oh, 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 oh. The neighbor says, what is wrong with your dog? He's, there's something wrong. He's just moaning. Oh, I said, ain't nothing wrong with him. He just lay He's laying on a nail. He's too lazy to get up and move. <laughs> the most miserable people on the planet Earth are those people who know what God's will is in their life, and they won't do it. That, they're miserable. They got a divine call on their life to serve him, or maybe to come to Jesus and be saved, and, they, and they're just too lazy or too scared or too whatever, and they won't do it. Those are the most miserable people on the face of the earth. You know, I want you to notice the grace of the Father after he regretted it and he came back to the Lord. You know, he allowed him to work in his vineyard. God's a God of second chances. If you say no and God keeps working, he'll allow you to work. Now, secondly, notice the request and the quick response. The Father went to the second son and he said, I want you to work in my vineyard today. And he said, Okay, I'll go. But he never went. I want to think his intentions were good, but somehow I don't think so. He may have said yes real quick to get the old man off his back, you know. If I don't say yes, he'll just keep on and on. So, yeah, I'll tell him yeah. It, it could have been an emotional response. He wanted to please his father, you know. But he just kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. Some of you are like that. God's got a call on your life, and you just keep putting it off. Well, I'm going to do this first. 
I, I want to do that first. And you put it off and you put it off until the opportunity passes. Y'all know what the five second rule is, don't you? You drop something on the floor. If it's not there more than five seconds, you can eat it, right? Yeah. A guy by the name of Claire DeGraff wrote a book, and in this book he talks about the 10 second rule. And the 10 second rule is simply this. When you know what God's will is, do it within the next 10 seconds. Now think about that. If you know what God's will is in the next 10 seconds, do it. Don't put it off. Try that for a month. You know. Many times I put it off. God, God, I'd be driving down the road and God said, I want you to speak to so-and-so. No, I don't want to do that. And I go down the road about a block or two. I want you to go that per Okay, and I turn around. I wasted 20 minutes. <laughs> Why are we like that? You know. The quicker you do a difficult task, the more blessed you are. We put off doing the difficult task sometimes because it's hard. Listen, if it's hard, do it first. When God spoke to Abraham, he said, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. I want you to take him to a mountain. I'm going to show you. I don't want you to offer as a sacrifice to me. I can't imagine anything more difficult than that. And you read the scripture, it says immediately, the next morning, Abraham got up, got things ready, and took Isaac. The very next day. He, he didn't argue with God. He didn't put it off. He said, well, God, let me wait a little older. God, let me fellowship with him a little longer. He did it the very next day. When God speaks, if it's difficult, do it now. It only gets harder when you put it off. It only gets harder. You know, some people don't serve the Lord because they haven't really counted the cost. Jesus tells us to count the cost. He tells us in Luke 9, 23, if any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself daily, take up his cross, and follow me. He lets you know if you're going to follow him, what it's going to cost you. Folks, the cross is heavy. It was so heavy, Jesus couldn't carry it up Calvary's mountain. He was so debilitated from the beating they gave him that he could not carry that heavy cross. They conscripted Simon to carry his cross. A cross is heavy. That's why we don't like to carry him. It hurts to be crucified, folks. The Bible tells us we need to crucify the flesh. It hurts. Sometimes it hurts our pride, and sometimes it physically hurts us. It's hard. But listen, there's nothing that helps or heals like carrying the cross of Jesus. You see, God doesn't call us under false pretenses. When he calls you to follow him, he lets you know what's coming. He lets you know it's not going to be a life of ease. It's going to be a difficult life, you know. In Acts chapter 9, when Saul of Tarsus met Jesus on the Damascus road, he was blinded. God spoke to Ananias and said that Saul of Tarsus is praying. I want you to go talk to him and lift the scales from his eyes. And then I said, are you sure, Lord? Did I hear you right? Why, he's persecuting Christians. He's putting them in jail. He's killing them. And God said, you go. He's a chosen vessel of mine. He's going to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel and show him how great things he'll suffer for my name's sake. From the get-go, God said, Paul, if you serve me, you're going to suffer. Yes or no, will you go? And Paul went. If you knew it would cause you physical suffering, would you still serve the Lord? Would you serve the Lord if it cost you everything? Would you still go, yes or no? Now, let's relate this parable to us today. Does God have the right to command us to serve him? Yes, he does. He's God. He has the right. You know. What does work in his vineyard entail? Well, he tells us that in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. He said, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. He has the authority. He paid the price. He paid our debt. He hung on the cross, suspended between heaven and, and earth as if he wasn't fit for either one. And he suffered the humiliation and the pain and the agony of the cross. He has the right 
to ask you to serve in his vineyard. He said, all authority is given to me. Go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them what I've taught you. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and lo, I'm with you always, even in the world. And I want you to notice something about the Great Commission. He promised to be with us if we make disciples. Whatever else we do, folks, as a church, if we don't make disciples, we're not being obedient to Christ. You know. Go to all the world to make disciples. What are some reasons people refuse today to serve the Lord? I think it's because of laziness. Some people are just too lazy. God never commanded a lazy person to do anything except repent. You read in the Gospels, the people Jesus called to serve him, they were doing something. Four of them were involved in the fishing business, a very energetic occupation. Are you too lazy to serve the Lord? You say, send someone else, Lord. Here am I, send my brother. Here am I, send someone else. Maybe we're too self-centered. But we like our comfort. God has to get us out of our comfort zone to serve him. When you get out of your comfort zone, you depend on God, not yourself. You know. Sometimes, you know, you need to realize God's not concerned about your comfort. He's concerned about your conformity to the image of Christ. You know. The late Bailey Smith went to Russia right after the Iron Curtain fell. Preaching in a little church. It was in the wintertime. Snow was on the ground. It's cold. He said there's as many people outside the church as there was inside the church. He said the pastor said something in Russian. The windows were opened, and he said a blast of cold air came rushing in. He said those on the inside of the church had to inconvenience themselves so those on the outside of the church could hear the gospel. Folks, we need to inconvenience ourselves for those on the outside who need to hear the gospel. You see, the church exists for the benefit of those who don't come. Now, you think about that. It don't exist for your benefit as much as it does for those outside the church. Our job is to go outside the four walls. The problem in the church is not how to get more people in these seats. The problem is how to get the people in these seats out in the world serving the Lord, telling people about Jesus. That's the biggest problem we have, Mike. It's how to get people outside telling other people. Sometimes we don't do it because we think, well, you know, I, I just, I'm just not smart enough. I'm not educated. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Let me give you my personal paraphrase of that. I, who am nothing, can do anything through him who is everything. I, who am nothing, can do anything through him who is everything. It's Christ in you that does it, not you. We're to be a conduit that his Holy Spirit can flow through us to benefit other people. Don't depend on you. It depends on him. And when you're surrendered to him, he can do mighty things through you because of who he is, not because of who you are. I remember when I served the church in Okeechobee. Our church had grown. We were having three services. After the second service, the Lord spoke to me. And in my heart, the Lord said to me, I'm going to show you my power in the third service. I was so excited. About more than 10 minutes into the third service, I literally couldn't say nothing. I, I just couldn't even speak. And to close the service, the, the minister of music went back to his office. Our associate pastor ran back and said, hey, John's giving the invitation. And Rusty said, oh, he is not. He preached 40 minutes the last time. Minister of music wasn't in there. He didn't have no music. Little old boy came forward made a profession of faith in Christ. 
not because of anything I'd done. The Lord spoke to my heart and said, that's my power right there. You can't save anybody. You can't make anybody get right. That's my power right there. Don't depend on you, John. It depends on me. Yes or no, will you go? Don't depend on your education. Don't depend on your intelligence. It depends on your willingness to go and let Jesus do through you what he wants to do. Divine authority and human response. I read about a pastor who went to an African-American church to preach a revival. Well-known evangelist. God had used him. He could play the piano. He got there early. He was playing on the piano very softly. He was saying, I will. I will. I will. And as people come in, they kind of picked up the chorus. They were I will, I will. And the church filled up with people, and they were saying, I will, I will, I will. And he stopped, and he started to pray. Lord, you've heard our response. Now, what's your question? What's your question? You've heard the will of God. Yes or no, will you go? Maybe God's calling you to come and be saved. Just in a moment, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. If you're not saved and the Spirit of God is drawing you to come, come. Maybe you're here and God's been dealing with your heart for some time about service. Maybe as a missionary. Maybe preaching the gospel. Maybe serving in some other capacity in the church and you've been kind of resisting. Divine authority, he's called. Yes or no, will you go? I'm going to ask you to stand and I'm going to pray. And the praise team is going to come and sing. What's your response to the Spirit of God? Lord Jesus, I'm so thankful that you're a God of second chances. And Father, there's folks here that's been struggling with your call. There's folks here that you've been called to missions. Or you've called them to service. And they've been struggling with that. Let them say yes. There are those here today that's struggling with the call to be saved. And I pray that today they would let go and say yes and trust you as their personal Lord and Savior. We give you all the credit and the praise and the glory because it belongs to you and not to us. For it's in the mighty name of my Savior, Jesus Christ, I beg these things.